The following content is meant purely for educational and informational purposes and should not be relied upon as financial, investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. This is the Fundamentals Podcast, where we demystify crypto and help you navigate this ever-evolving internet native economy. In this episode, we're joined by Martin Leinweber, Digital Asset Strategist at Market Vector, for an insightful discussion on digital asset indexing. Market Vector and Token Terminal have been working together to provide institutions, advisors, and investors with access to investable products that track the breadth of data available in Web3 and on blockchains. Earlier this month, we announced the launch of the Market Vector Token Terminal Fundamental Index Suite, a novel approach to creating multi-token baskets, and in this episode, we dive into all of the details around this. Martin breaks down the process of developing index products, what the current state of the market is, and where the need for multi-token baskets stems from. We speak about the selection and weighting approach for the Fundamentals Index Suite, covering the structure, composition, backtesting results, initial market response, and more. Martin also walks us through the impact that real-time on-chain data has on indexing and sheds some light on the regional differences in the perception of crypto today. Tune in for an insightful discussion about the fundamentals of digital asset indexing. Oh my god, the amount of dog coins I'm seeing on my feed again right now is incredible. <laughs> Yeah, bonk is all over the place, right? It is. With the Saga phone, you know, I mean. It's hilarious. Token incentives to sell physical products. But it makes sense. I mean, you get now $500 worth of bonk and the phone costs are almost amortized then. So why not? It's a phone for free, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely is. Hopefully, maybe for at least the next hour, we could focus a bit more on what's going on outside of just the dog coins in this space. Because that is definitely where we want to be in the long run, even though that is fun. And I have to admit that I do spend a bit of time staring at those charts as well. In the long run, we want to make sure that, you know, capital is allocated to the value generating DAOs and innovations in this space. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we're aligned on that. So welcome to the Fundamentals Podcast. Of course. Yes. All right. Excited to do this because, you know, it's been a long time coming. Market Vector and Token Terminal have been working closely for quite some time now in order to introduce a first of its kind suite of fundamentals based digital asset indexes. And now that the news is finally out, it's super cool. And today I want to dive into everything around these Market Vector Token Terminal fundamental indexes and also, of course, your general approach to digital asset indexing at Market Vector as you are kind of paving the path on that front. But before we start diving into the details, there would be great if you can give a quick introduction to Market Vector for anyone not familiar. Yeah, sure. Pleasure. So yeah, Market Vector is, is an EU benchmark regulated index provider. I think we are well known for our capabilities in thematic equity indexing. So we do multi-asset classes, but we also do digital asset indexes since 2017. And I always count uh, the crypto years and stock years. Yeah. So we're doing that now for a very long time. Our classic clients are yeah, the asset managers in the crypto space, the, the crypto asset managers and uh, crypto exchanges. They, they want to launch exchange traded products. Yeah. It could be an ETF, ETN, or also on the derivative side. So whenever you need a reference price or reference for a basket, yeah, people come to us and together with, with our clients, we develop and customized indexes. Got it. Th that's great. Now, in the space of digital asset indexing, because Market Vector has done a lot before getting into the digital asset space, now you've kind of taken the role of a pioneer here as someone who has built a very strong brand in the TradFi world. Could you speak a bit about the, your journey into the crypto space and how digital assets really fit into Market Vector's broader vision? You mean the personal journey or the Market Vector journey? These are two different things. So just to be precise. Yes, I was thinking Market Vector journey here. But of course, uh, if you want to combine that with personal, feel free to. So yeah, no, happy to do that. I mean, I have to say in 2017, uh, we got the call from Venec for doing an index for a spot Bitcoin ETF. Sounds familiar, the story. So we needed a proper regulated index for their product. And we did that. And of course, we, we, we didn't stop here. We also uh, created them uh, for other single token indexes, also baskets, which was uh, pretty early. And now I have to say, we still talk about a spot Bitcoin ETF, right? Although there's a very like, a high likelihood that we will finally see a spot Bitcoin ETF here. 
luckily we weren't dependent on our friends from the US. So the good thing about an index company is that you truly work on a global basis. So during the last years, yeah, we, we licensed digital asset indexes all around the world. Yeah. From Canada to Brazil, of course, a lot of stuff in Europe. Yeah. Primarily then also in Germany and in Switzerland. And, uh, it's, it's an interesting journey because you, when we started that in 2017, we also had the fork wars yeah, with Bitcoin. So what the hell does that mean yeah, from an index perspective? And yeah, we've improved on a lot of things. We know what's important when it comes to, to, to prices and exchanges and, and, and all that stuff. Of course, we, we witnessed also the debacle of Terra Luna and uh, FTX, and, and of course, that also has an impact on our indexes. And so I think we are battle proven, but I also know that you never can say in crypto, I've seen everything. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure in the future, we will see other wild things where we have to find a solution. So that's it basically in a nutshell. Yeah, for sure. A lot of learnings along the way, but I, I would agree if you've been around since uh, 2017 in this space and you're still alive, you are pretty battle proven. We've lost a lot of people on the way, but I'm glad you mentioned the call you got from Vanek in 2017 about the Bitcoin spot ETF, because that has been a pretty hot topic of discussion, especially around this current rally in the markets. And I feel that for a lot of people, we're just speaking at kind of a title level at, okay, Bitcoin spot ETF is coming, but many probably don't understand what the process of getting a, an ETF like that together and putting it out to the market looks like. So I was wondering if you could walk us through the process of developing, say, for the purpose of this podcast, like an index product at market vector, which could then also shed a bit of light to people wondering what it actually looks like from going from idea to actual market launch. So I think there are two perspectives. One, one trigger for a lot of indexes is a lot of client talks and client interest. Yeah. So a client comes up with a specific idea and then the whole process starts. Or what we also have to do, and it's especially my job to do market research and, and to understand investors' needs and maybe also identify gaps in existing offerings, index offerings. Yeah. So you can say you have to identify a purpose. And that could be tracking a particular market segment, market sector, yeah, also in, in crypto, or you have an, an, a specific investment theme in mind. And then also very often together with the client, you design a methodology. Yeah, you define the criteria for the inclusion or exclusion of components in an index, whether it's market cap weighted or equal weighted, you, you think about liquidity. It's also a, a big concern very often, or you would focus on a specific sector classification because keep in mind an index at the end of the day is nothing else than an algorithm, right? It's a, it's a rules-based approach. Yeah. And if you have that, and you also think about the rebalancing frequency and all that stuff, then it comes to the backtesting. And that's the most interesting part. Then, uh, then you see if your idea was really good. Yeah, if you, you see how it performs, yeah, you use your historical data set to assess the performance and the volatility of, of the strategy. And that's for me the most interesting part. But I have to highlight that and that's the recommendation do not over optimize. Yeah, there is uh, very rapidly you fall into this tendency to do what we say data mining, right? Yeah, you do backtest and backtest again, you iterate and iterate till it looks okay. And very often, if the, the strategies are too complex, they can't promise what they, they hold from the backtest yeah, in the future. So I'm a really a fan of a simple and robust approach, which is not over-optimized and is also easy to understand. Because I've worked for many years in quant backgrounds yeah, and a quant manager, very often the whole industry likes to have to, or to build a factor zoo, right? You yeah, have a lot of factors, which, which looks nice, but often you have the problem when you underperform, you also don't know where the underperformance is coming from because it's so complex. You, you don't know where to tweak, where to change something. And so if you have an easy strategy, a very simple one, 
it's also easier to sit through the bear market cycles and also to explain it at the end of the day to the client. That's also very important. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a very important point that you alluded to there, that keeping it simple and to build on that, especially in this crypto space, where I think that a lot of clients that you work with find just the very general elements of the crypto space quite confusing on itself. So you don't want to add an extremely confusing model to that mix or algorithm to that mix that then just makes it impossible to kind of approach maybe building a bit on your previous answer. In addition to simplicity, what is your current strategy for digital asset indexing? When you think of putting these together and going to market, how, how do you approach that? Yeah, so at the end of the day, our business is to, to license those indexes, right? We don't do that for our own sake and, and just to have a beauty index farm, right? Which, which looks good. So we still have a lot of single token indexes. Yeah, that's still a, a trend we see. So especially in Europe, you have uh, a lot of uh, ETNs out there, yeah, which refer to a single token, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, what have you. We have a lot of multi-token strategies. Yeah, so the baskets, top five, 10, 25. Yeah, so the really broad baskets to capture the crypto return. We've developed a sector classification. I think that's also not well understood in general that you have sectors in crypto. And we also launched a staking yield family, which refers to the Ethereum staking rewards reference rate. I think that's also an important pillar going forward. And last but not least, I mean, we talk about that or so touch on that later. We launched the first fundamental index suite, yeah, which is, I think, a very important building block uh, going forward for institutional investors. Yes, I, I definitely do agree on that. Uh, we'll dive a bit deeper into the fundamental index uh, in, in, in a few questions. But I still wanted to ask a bit about, as you license these indexes to others, at the moment, are you able to shed light on who your main kind of clients are? So what the target audience for these indexes that you're putting together is? It's still... I have to say, yeah, it's twofold. So I would say a heavy weight on the asset managers out there. So the spot Bitcoin ETF is, is really, although it's a very simple product, right? It's, it's just about Bitcoin. It's a really important trigger, I think, going forward to see more of these exchange traded products, not only in the US, but I think that will just lower the perceived career risk also for other asset managers all around the world so that we just see uh, more of that. Because uh, if you think of it, I think there are roughly 52 billion assets under management in these exchange-traded products. And the bulk of it, 38 billion, is still in Bitcoin. Yeah. Then you have 10 billion in ETH products, so just Ethereum. And then 3.2 billion are just in, in baskets. And I think... The demand for strategies, yeah, at the end of the day, as an index provider, you provide strategies, portfolio strategies. I think this demand should go up because it's really hard for the average investor to decide which token to buy. I mean, it's maybe easy. You can say Bitcoin is a core investment, maybe Ethereum, although I've heard today that people are coming to me, oh, why do we have Ethereum? Yeah, we don't need that anymore. We have Solana, right? So, so the market is very narrative driven. So you see already, it's, it's after Bitcoin, it's hard. Yeah. What do I buy? Do I buy Solana now? We see Avalanche is pumping. Shall I buy Avalanche? Is this the chain coming back again, etc. So it really makes sense to have simple strategies, even if it's, if it's just a market cap weighted strategy that enables you to buy the crypto market return. Yeah, so that you can sit back and relax, have a simple strategy, make sure that you get the crypto return and don't have to worry that you sit on a bunch, a bunch of single token, which, which maybe uh, are not hot again in the next cycle. Yeah, and I think that's also goes hand in hand what we've developed with you guys. Yeah, how can we improve on that multi-token strategies? And so that should be very interesting for a lot of the advisors out there, especially also for a lot of TradFi people 
want to enter or have to enter the space now? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you said had to enter because th that is exactly how it is. <laughs> Whether they like it or not, they have to enter the space. It, it is inevitable. But what you said there about these multi-token baskets and making it easier for people to get exposure to a broader range of them, that's, that's just a natural evolution of the space. It, it feels almost like a no-brainer that it has to come and there needs to be a lot of multi-token token baskets that people can choose from. Because if we think of the stock market, for example, and from, from just for the sake of this example, comparing a retail investor's perspective, if you don't know much about the markets, are you more likely to pick an individual stock or would you take a basket that is an index of a broader market? And I feel that these indexes are the ones that have really lowered the barrier to entry in investing into the stock market back in the day. So that definitely has to happen in the crypto space as well. There just hasn't been too much to choose from yet. But Moving on to our collaboration that you alluded to there already in lowering this barrier to entry and giving people exposure to these multi-token baskets. And in our case, baskets of assets that are picked into that basket based on their value generation, user activity, fee generation, which is the fundamental approach. I kind of want to emphasize how important of a step that is in the evolution process of crypto moving away from pure speculation in the eyes of more traditional and institutional capital markets, because I think that's been the main concern for people looking on the outside in. That's all the media speaks about <laughs> up until now. I feel we're at a tipping point, slowly starting to speak more and more about fundamentals, which is great because from day one at Token Terminal, our thesis has been that cryptocurrencies will mature into on-chain businesses, clear business models, cash flows, long-term economic value creation, right? And then this ecosystem will grow into a universally accepted global asset class. And as this happens, of course, you know, the speculative and narrative based investing shift towards the fundamentals. So naturally, in line, someone needs to introduce the financial products to the market that align with this. So it has been incredible to work with you guys at Market Vector and having our visions align in putting this index together that actually reflects the longer term vision, value based investing in this space. And I truly do believe it'll be such an important catalyst for helping both educate people, which you alluded to, which the space really needs so much, while also providing an amazing product to get a fundamentals based exposure to the best performing crypto protocols and networks. But but yeah, that, that was a bit of a long prelude there. But with us at TT being the kind of subject matter expert in on chain data, and you at Market Vector being the subject matter experts in structuring and getting into the market, these new index products, could you detail what the Market Vector Token Terminal Fundamental Index Suite actually is? So maybe speak a bit about the structure, composition, these indexes, and what makes them novel and unique. Yeah, maybe a good start is what is the bread and butter so far, yeah? And, and maybe then explain what the differences is with these new indexes, yeah? So uh, normally you alluded to the, the market is used to market cap weighted strategies, uh, which I have to say is always a good start. I still like market cap weighted strategies. It represents the markets and it's, it's also pretty hard to outperform, right? And, and it, as I said, it guarantees you to get the, also the crypto market return. Yeah, you're, you're implicitly, I mean, I'm simplifying here, you're buying the winners and selling the losers. So that's a good strategy to start with. But on the other hand, sometimes I hear from investors, yeah, you have, you have mean coins in it, in the top 10, for example, right? You suddenly have Doge or why do you have this old token, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin? I mean, nobody uses that, right? I mean, it's a failed use case. Yeah, um, I always say Litecoin is the, the poor man's Bitcoin. Yeah, and my Bitcoin Cash, nobody uses that for payments. But it's still large and it's still in the index. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's the algorithm, right? That's, that's the truth in that sense in terms of market cap. So the idea was how can you maybe improve that so that you also maybe give investors some, some confidence in those token. And so we, we thought that it would be interesting not to select based on market cap criteria, but maybe select on fundamentals yeah so now what are fundamentals so we look at on-chain data and look at the economic traction of a protocol and also we can look at network effects 
So network effects are driven by user activity. Yeah, how many users does a protocol have and, and how large is the interaction between the users? And so suddenly you can select on another basis with the effect that for the indexes we now have, yeah, we consider fees and active users. You suddenly have a nice barber structure between some large coins such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is still part of the index. But you also suddenly have in protocols such as Arbitrum or Optimism, as of Layer 2s or Lido, a liquid staking protocol, which is pretty interesting because to get that in a normal top 10 index, uh, so we are also focusing on the top 10 fundamental token, to get that in a normal top 10 market cap weighted index, it for sure takes more time. Yeah. So the hope is to, to capture protocols earlier, which have traction in the market. And so we overall consider a top 50 universe and, and, and look at this top 50 universe based on fundamentals. And so far, I really like the structure and we had also very interesting discussions with clients so far. Yeah. So it's really. Have, having another another view on on selecting protocols at what are you normally used to when it comes to indexing that that is a great overview of the structure i feel it's so important for crypto in general to have a basket of assets where people can understand okay these are actually platforms that people use when you take the top 10 most used protocols that there is activity there is actually quite a lot of fees generated but in in addition to this purely fundamentals-based index, which has a balancing based on fees and active users, we do also have the market cap weighted index that we put out alongside that. So could you maybe shed light on why you Mark Victor see that it was also kind of necessary or why it made sense to also bring out a market cap weighted index alongside this? That's a very good question. I was very focused on the selection part of the token. So apart from what token or which protocol is in the index, of course, another important question is how do you weight that? Yeah. And here we also have two versions. So one version is fundamentally weighted. So we take the same criteria again, uh, fees and users to come up with a other weighting than you normally have in market cap weighting. So to simplify it, you give protocols with more user activity, more fees, a higher weight than protocols which have uh, lower user activity. And so, for example, suddenly, for example, Ethereum has a higher weight than Bitcoin. Uh, that's not what you normally have in a market cap weighted index. But on the other hand, we thought maybe in addition to this pure fundamental view, it could be interesting to blend the fundamental selection with a market cap weighting to have the best of both worlds. So on the one hand, you have a fundamental selection. On the other hand, you are capturing market sentiment via a market cap weighting. Now I have to be honest, it's not a pure market cap weighting because we've also applied a capping and a floor. What does it mean? As uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin is so large in terms of market cap compared to the smaller altcoins, uh, we want to have a minimum amount of diversification. Yeah. So instead of having, I don't know, 70% in Bitcoin and Ethereum and a long, small tail in the altcoins, so a lower weight, we thought we kept that and also give them the index of floor to make the impact of the smaller coins also meaningful. And that's very interesting. So both indexes perform quite well with. I have to say the market cap weighted strategy even better. So it'll be interesting to see in the future how both indexes perform and where the strengths and weaknesses are in specific cycles. Yes, yeah, so I can imagine that the fundamentally weighted thing really outperforms in a strong bull market in the late cycle, while the market cap weighted strategy overall is also maybe a little bit more defensive in, in the bear market. Yeah. So that will be interesting to see how that develops going forward. Yeah, 100%. That's a really great overview of both of them and the reasoning there as well. 
Now, if anyone's maybe wondering oh, why, if you go to Token Terminal, you see that there are so many metrics right now that we can look at in the crypto space that why we ended up on active users and fees. And fr from our perspective, kind of short answer to that is, if you look at the state of the crypto market today, the best proxy for economic activity is active users and fee generation. And that is a like, great place to start in introducing a basket of assets for people to get into it. And then we can go into these more complex strategies once we begin to onboard people who are more interested in, in more specific, specific places. But in your perspective, when we were like running back tests based on this data, was there anything that stood out to you or kind of any key learnings from that? Yeah, so at the beginning, we had no clue if, if those fundamental factors really work right if if it's if it really has merit already in the crypto space because the the space is so harshly narrative driven right but what was really eye catching when we focused on on fees and users is that we could increase the sharp ratio meaning the risk adjusted return so we really had a strong outperformance in the last bull market so in 2021 and almost had the same underperformance as our normal top 10 index. Yeah? So the beauty of the fundamental top 10 index is we can really compare it to our classic old top 10 market cap weighted index. And, and so we really saw you had an outperformance in the bull market while having the same drawdown in the bear market. Yeah? So this strategy didn't come up with a higher volatility. So to say, yeah. So the risk adjusted reward was really higher. And that's something which also I, I liked a lot and was very convincing. And as I said, not with an army of different factors. Yeah. So we just used, as you alluded to, fees and users. Also, maybe we have to say we give, we give a higher weight on fees. Why? Because you know the problem with wallet generation. Yeah, so there can be, you can generate multiple wallets, multiple addresses. Yeah, you have this UTXO problem with Bitcoin specifically. That's the reason why we, we gave this fundamental ranking and, and we gave a higher weight on fees. And, and what was also eye-catching is even if you include other factors, then you basically get the same set of tokens. Yeah, there's only slightly difference because normally if you have traction, a lot of users, high fees. Of course, you also have the developers on your side, right? Well, of course, you also have the transaction volume. So and that was the reason why we, we focused on, on those two figures, also with the highest coverage and also just on on-chain ratios, which are real-time and recorded on the blockchain. Yeah. So we didn't include off-chain off fundamentals, so to say. Exactly. That, that's a great overview again. Now, these indexes also include customization features that empower clients to tailor them to specific investment needs and, and whatever their goals might be. What, what does this mean in practice? Could you maybe give some example of how this customization could look like? Yeah, so very often, um, or put it another way, it's rare that we create an index and a client comes and takes us from our shelves and, and plugs it to their product, right? So every client comes with different constraints that can begin with, with the simple pricing thing that uh, you have different closing times, a client wants to use different pricing pairs, different exchanges, et cetera, or also has constraints regarding the universe. Yeah, so you have to adjust the universe again. I mean, pretty similar to what you have when you go to a car dealer. Yeah, you see a nice car. Maybe you don't like the color. You want other rims, larger rims. Maybe you want to turbocharge it. Yeah, you know how it works. And that's the same for, for the index. Yeah. And um, so customization is an important feature. And uh, it's, it's also interesting that we can use the full uh, token terminal suite. So it's can be that the client says, hey, I'm, I'm, I have an edge in, in looking at the developers, right? Or I have a different view on, on, on certain fundamentals. And also maybe I don't want to focus on, on the 30-day fees, but on a 90-day fee figure, et cetera. So these are all small components we can adjust. And at the end of the day, we are a service provider. You know, we don't say that the indexes we've created, although I think they are proper indexes, that's the holy grail. 
Yeah, so there are different ways to adjust them. And so at the end of the day, we are agnostic. So we, we advise our clients and, and if they want a different subset of fundamentals or have a, a predefined universe, yeah, we can do that. And I think that's important to be open and, and to have these customization features. Yes, that, that is a very good anal analogy to the car dealership as well. So this is the product that you showcase, you throw people in, and then you start working on what the end result or end product is that they actually want and cater that to their needs. That That's great. Now, given that this announcement was made very recently, do you have anything yet to share about kind of the market's reception to the fundamental index suite or the discussions that you've been having? That's interesting. So overall, the people like it. Yeah. So let's say some of the clients are surprised Yeah, that they are fundamentals. I think we still have to do educational work on that front. Yeah, that the protocol can earn fees Yeah, because everybody's very focused on Bitcoin. And I always see the narrative, oh, it has no cash flow. Yeah, it's like gold. You can't value it. I mean, there are tokens without a cash flow, but there are a lot of, of tokens and protocols which produce a cash flow. And so it's very engaging when we discuss that with, with clients. And it also gives them a guidance as I always compare those protocols with startups, right? Yeah, so investing, you're a VC investor when you're buying these crypto tokens. And that's something you normally can't do. When we look at the equity world and you look at an IPO, the average age of a company then is around 10 years. Uh, so I would say that's not a startup anymore. And so in, in crypto, people welcome that, that you have additional factors to rate those tokens. Now, what is really interesting is there are huge regional differences when you show the basket. Yeah, for example, we had a lot of discussion on Tron. Yeah, so Tron is part of the index. Why? Because you might know it, Tron earns a lot of money, a lot of fees, has a lot of active users. Why? Because Tron has found its use case in the stablecoin arena, right? So I think 60% of Tether is settled on Tron and a lot of USDC. So while I hear, yeah, Solana will do stablecoins and, and Ethereum will lose out, no, Ethereum is not the competitor for stablecoins. It's Tron. So, and people always think of Justin Sun, and he's a very polarizing figure, but that's not our approach. Yeah, we look at data. And so if I just look at, at how the fee generation is and then the traction on a user basis, you have to include Tron. Now, when you talk to Asian guys, yeah, or even in Europe, they understand that, yeah? So you have the problem more in the US, yeah? They have a different view on that. Suddenly, if you are in Asia, they love that, yeah? They maybe say, hey, why do you have Bitcoin? And then you say, hey, Bitcoin also generates fees, yeah? You have this ordinal thing, yeah? So finally, you have uh, fees pumping up on Bitcoin, which, which I welcome, right? But if you talk to a maxi, they still don't like that, yeah? So I think it's a dumb discussion. I think they should welcome it. But that's very interesting to see these regional differences, yeah. And it's also, again, important to have this customization feature because I can imagine we launch a different version for the U.S. guys, yeah, than for, for the Asian client set, so to say. But it's normal. You never find an index where 100% of the people agree. But the good thing is people understand the concept of this on-chain criteria and see the value of maybe I should consider more than just price. And that's important. Yeah, that is truly fascinating how the viewpoints differ so much by kind of geographic location, but it makes a lot of sense because I, I have bumped into that quite often that when we take these Western countries, the data behind Tron kind of catches people off guard especially because they're pretty much number one in a lot of the dashboards on Token Terminal. People are like, what is actually going on? That can't be true. That can't be true. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I, I had Justin on this podcast yeah. a few months back where all we spoke about was stable coins. And I, I personally spend quite a bit of time in like the Middle East where you see it in real life that 
the stable coins are used in day-to-day -day commerce transactions on Tron. And that was the first place where I noticed that, okay, damn, this has actually been made to be pretty easy to use. Where I'm right now, or where I spend most of my time, like in Europe, we have nothing close to that yet. So uh, <laughs> there is something real going on there. Data doesn't lie. Exactly. And if you look, I mean, you have this on your dashboard. If you look at the most successful smart contracts, it's uh, stablecoin contracts and decentralized exchanges. These are our killer user apps so far. Yeah. One is speculation and the other is stable coins. And people forget that. So, but that's a good point. Yeah? We underestimate that in the Western world, how important that is, this, this money payment remittance thing. We definitely do. You need to be at the grassroots level and really go uh, experience it to see it. But it is uh, fascinating. It also kind of brings forth one of the true core value propositions of what crypto had in the very beginning is that banking the unbanked. That That's what kind of Tron has been doing with that. But moving on to another kind of core value proposition of crypto, especially from like an investor's point of view, and I'd say also like a regulator's point of view, is the availability of pretty much real-time open on-chain data. And from an investor's point of view, that changes a lot of things for venture investors. It's all of a sudden this startup investing that you spoke about turns into liquid venture instead of buying an unlisted company and waiting for 10 years for a binary outcome of IPO or go bust. How about from an index provider's perspective? When you're, say, say when we're putting together this fundamentals index, how does the availability of this pretty much real-time on-chain permissionless data affect your approach compared to if you were to put together a more traditional index? I wouldn't say it changes necessarily the approach. Yeah. So we approach every S class with the same regulatory prudence, right? With, with, with the same process. I would say it, it, it changes the, the possibilities to create new indexes, right? So for example, I can imagine that we can also think about an event-based strategy where the inclusion or exclusion of token is based on real-time on-chain data, right? So that you don't do that on a fixed time interval, yeah, looking on a monthly or quarterly basis, but whenever a protocol is hitting certain threshold fees or transaction volume or what have you, that you start a rebalancing of the index. And that's something which is... Yeah, in the thread five worlds, yeah, you have quarterly financial statements, even with a time lag then, right? Where this approach I think isn't isn't very fruitful. But suddenly in the crypto world, you can't think about such data because you really have real time financial statements which are in quotation marks audited, right? So they are the truth on chain. So it's immutable, locked on the blockchain. And I think that that's super fascinating for me because it just opens a new realm of possibilities. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how those possibilities turn into reality. Now with the integration to the on-chain data, the wearable to provide a token terminal. I also in my mind have like so many visions for different types of triggers and rebalancing events and stuff that could be used in super innovative ways in these indexes. So excited to see how that develops. And definitely, hopefully, we can pretty soon already in this market environment find the demand for these indexes that you've now put out and then start building on that. But I'm, I'm pretty optimistic myself. But on market vector side, because you probably do map out these things before you launch, what kind of expectations do you have for like the fundamental index suite that was now put out in terms of demand and what 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 your goals are? I think with with the you see that more sophisticated investors are entering that space, right? So with institutional investors, suddenly also have investors who understand fundamental investing from the the thread fiber world. And so, as I said, with the expectations that, or at least my expectations that we will see more multi-token baskets. I think we really have a good opportunity also to convince people that they should think about fundamental investing in crypto as well. So I can't name things yet, but we, we will roll out the first strategies soon, which are investable. So and you will hear that soon. So it's already a good start right from the beginning. You always 
has to give your indexes a little bit time to to gain traction, yeah, to to explain it to the investor audience, etc. But I think the bull market, of course, is helping. So people are, are interested also in, in in other stuff, and so I'm pretty confident that next year will be also the year for for those indexes. Definitely. Yep, that's that's a great answer. Looking forward to seeing everything play out on that front now. I think we're speaking about all the opportunities, possibilities that comes with building indexes for the digital asset space and the benefits that on-chain real-time data brings. I also want to quickly like kind of address risks because when you're paving the path in kind of a new market sector or new asset class as you're doing, you probably need to be pretty aware of where things could go wrong. What do you see as the main challenges or risks associated with using kind of real-time open crypto data for indexing and how how do you kind of mitigate these at market vector so one one threat if you use real-time data and especially also very volatile data that you produce a lot of turnover in your strategy right and turnover also means transaction costs and, and turnover also means you have to think about liquidity which which is still i mean it, it's getting better Right now with bull markets and then also expect that with the ATS that the liquidity will improve, but you don't want a strategy where you constantly trade in and out, in and out, yeah, paying the bid ask spread. And so that's something we, we think a lot about how to also consider liquidity and also uh, have a buffer, yeah. So that you avoid these unnecessary trades, yeah. So that you don't always, if you have a top 10 index, yeah, you have a coin, which is number 10, next month, 11, then 10 again, then 11 again. Yeah. And you, you, you trade it in and out and in and out. That's something we, we avoid with a buffer. And then also when it comes to return data, that it can be that it's, it's pretty noisy. Yeah, so that's that's the reason why we cooperate with you guys. Yeah, you you breath and live on chain data, and so we know that you do a lot of stuff in in terms of standardizing, cleaning it, yeah, and that's that's really important. That's it's not a garbage in garbage out problem anymore. Yeah, you really want to have high quality data you can rely on, and then apply to the index. Yeah, this real time thing. I mean, our indexes are also ticking real time. Although I have to say, sometimes it's the overkill. Yeah, you don't necessarily need everything real time all the time. Yeah, but in crypto, suddenly everybody asks for real time index. Although most of them just look once a day on on the closing price, right? But you need every fifteen seconds. Okay, we deliver every fifteen seconds. But that's a that's a really uh, crypto specific thing, right? It's clients ask and uh, you shall deliver. Um, but it's 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 interesting though that you have. On one side of the spectrum, it's that. It's okay. Oh, we have data that updates every 15 seconds. Let's get that. And the other side, it's that, oh, does crypto have fees? We didn't yet understand it. So it is a pretty wide customer yeah. base that you need to <laughs> cater to <laughs> at Market Vector. Kind of taking from that, one of the main bottlenecks in going to market with these products is kind of education, which we spoke a bit about here. And I know that in addition to everything that you're doing at Market Vector and personally joining these pods and speaking stuff out, having customer calls, speaking with them, working with them to help them better understand, you are also launching a book to help on this front. So congrats on this upcoming book launch. That is amazing to see. I was wondering if you could give us a quick primer to what readers could expect from Mastering Crypto Assets. Yeah, thank you very much. So it's, it's by the way, it's the second book I co-authored. Yeah, so the first book was in, in, in German. Uh, gladfully, the second book comes out next month in English called Mastering Crypto Assets. And so the, the topic of the book is, it's really um, targeted to in this, uh, professional investors or institutional investors who want to invest in that space. So it's, it's not necessarily for the crypto teaching guy who puts money in, in a staking derivative protocol, gets the liquid staking derivative token and puts that in a margin or a credit lending borrowing protocol, lends out another token and, and so forth. It's really about how to approach crypto if I have a traditional portfolio. Because here's the thing, everybody always asks, shall I invest in this asset class in this token or another token. But the essential question is when it comes to investing, how much 
should I allocate? Yeah, how does that work? And so that's a great part of the book. Um, how to allocate? How much? How do the risk ratios change, etc.? Of course, we also talk about the fundamentals. Yeah, so uh, part of the book is really also I'm, I'm proud of is that we interviewed very important people in the space. Yeah, so for example, we had Jan Van Eck, we have Peter Brand, which is a legendary trader. We also talked to Fred Thiel from Marathon Digital to talk about mining. Yeah, it's also a misunderstood uh, sector. And you guys contributed a small part on, on fundamental ratios, right? We have Coinbase Asset Management, Ciba Bank, et cetera. So we really thought, okay, we have our expertise when it comes to the index investing and portfolio management view. But when there are legends like uh, Timothy Peterson from Kane Island Digital, who does a lot of stuff on Metcalfe's law and network effects, why not just asking him? And so... I think the book is really a very good overview of, of all those things, also a taxonomy, because it's not just about Bitcoin, right? People just look at the Bitcoin uh, performance, but uh, forgetting that there are other use cases, yeah? And I still believe that we will live in a multi-chain world, yeah? It's not everything will be built on Bitcoin. And therefore, it's extremely important to understand what you do when you invest in that space and how do you do proper risk management? And I think that's the target of the book. Such incredibly important points to touch on and get the word out to these professional capital allocators. And I do believe that you are the right person through your network and the stakeholders involved who've been interviewed in the book to get this book and the information in it out to the right readers to help a lot on the education front that we need to be working on in this space. So really looking forward to reading the whole book once it comes out as well and helping helping get the word out there. But final question to wrap this session up here, where do you see the digital asset market heading, the indexing market heading in, say, the next decade? So what do you see it looking like in the end game for digital assets? That's a good question. I mean, the end game, I think, for digital assets is that I maybe need a new title because I think everything will be a digital asset, right? So we have now this buzzword with real world assets, right? So tokenizing stocks, tokenizing bonds and all that stuff. So everything will, will be digital and, and the lines will be blurred. So I also think, or my hope is that you also get maybe new form of stocks, right? Where you have maybe other revenue streams and, and maybe also a dividend on a block by block basis. Yeah. So whether it's realistic or not, I don't know, but I think definitely in 10 years also, I think nobody will recognize that they use a blockchain. Yeah. So the user experience just has to get better. And so I think that's still a problem. Yeah, this bridging experience and, and signing here and, and, and signing there and, and, and waiting and, and it's, it's pretty complicated. That has to get better. And I think, for example, the ledger hack we, we had yesterday, I think the, these things have to improve. Yeah, it's, it's really bad that these things still happen. Yeah, and that's also the reason why people are always questioning the ETF. Why is the ETF coming? But uh, if you are a boomer, yeah, you don't have your own ledger device, right? You want to outsource it. But I think going forward with the indexes, I think a combination of crypto and real world assets could be interesting. And also when it comes, for example, to the fundamental stuff, I mean, we had a broad basket, but I can also imagine that the sectors going forward will be more important. And I can imagine that you also have crypto sector specific ratios you use. Yeah. So you should use maybe different ratios for DeFi than you have for gaming. Because I think everything is highly correlated at the moment. But honestly, Bitcoin should have nothing to do with a gaming token. Yeah. As in a gaming token should be completely unrelated to a decentralized physical infrastructure token. Yeah. At the moment, we don't have that. But I think going forward with better education, people will recognize the difference so that we, we, we can move forward and are not in this regime. Yeah, Bitcoin is the direction God. Yeah, so whenever Bitcoin is going up, 
the market is going up, the altcoin market with a higher beta, and we are, that we are not just speaking about Bitcoin and altcoins. I hate that. It's still the case, right? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't fit uh, the definition anymore, but that's my hope, yeah. 100%. And that's why it's so exciting to be collaborating with you guys, because we are so aligned on that future. It, it will be the new internet native economy. All businesses will be on chain. All assets will be on chain. And we just started like splitting that into different market sectors that we started doing on Token Terminal as well, that it is not just a basket of all coins. Like what? No, these are startups that we spoke about and you can segment them by market sector and kind of start building baskets on that and understanding how this new internet native economy is forming. And as entrepreneurs start to see that, okay, there's actually benefits in, there are more benefits than downsides to starting your business on chain instead of the traditional route, we'll start seeing more and more DAOs be founded on chain and that flywheel will start going. And then the capital will be more and more allocated towards these value generating DAOs as these entrepreneurs start building them on chain. So very much aligned. Can't wait to see that start playing out feel with somewhat of a tipping point and excited to see how this bull market plays out. But thank you so much, Martin, for this overview of your approach to indexing and everything related to our collaboration on the fundamentals index side. We'll definitely to do this again at some point to dive deeper into some topics once we have some traction and have some of the first strategies out there. But yeah, really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you very much, Oscar. It was really a pleasure speaking here. Yeah.